It's wonderful to see people that I know and meet a lot of new people that I've never met before. And it was such positive energy coming into the room and meeting everybody that I joined. So thank you. Yay! So after listening to Maureen speak, I started writing down what I've done over the past 20 years. Um, so my daughter's 22 years old. And what made me look to find out who I was and more about myself, which some people describe as spiritual growth, is my ex-husband left. And when he left, Stephanie was 18 months old, and he left New Year's Eve. <coughs> we sold our house within like a month, and next thing I know, I'm living in an apartment, had to find a home for my dog, and for the first month, living in my apartment felt like being in a hotel, even though I was surrounded by own, my own things. So here I was a single mom for three years, and the blessing of it was that my daughter didn't grow up in a situation where people were yelling at each other. So that was a blessing. The second blessing was that she became very close to her father because they had more personal time together and he could be present with her. And the other is, he and I never used a lawyer and we always traded weekends with each other. If he had somewhere to go, I would have Stephanie and if I had somewhere to go, he would have Stephanie, and that way she never ended up with babysitters or family. She was with us. So the benefit of it was, I started rebirthing breathwork the week before Sam told me he was leaving. And that is what got me through the whole process. So I was able to go to a lot of seminars in a very short period of time because I could always arrange weekends for Stephanie to be with Sam and I could go to the rebirthing center, which is in Jenkintown. And rebirthing breathwork is where you look at your birth script and how you play out those patterns in your life. And for some people, we play it out literally. Stephanie's a C-section. So for a C-section baby, one of the characteristics could be that they're going along and then they need help getting out. Similarly to a birth script of a C-section is they're going down the birth canal and they need help getting out. So a possible thing for C-sections could be they don't finish projects, they don't hold on to jobs, they need help. So I was able with what I learned to help Stephanie buy out of that pattern as a child. Um, so rebirthing breath work, I'm aware, is one of the areas in my life that has benefited me the greatest. And at the rebirthing center is where I met my current husband, Paul. So as a single parent, the thing that was most important to me was being married to somebody that doesn't forget my birthday. <laughs> so Paul and I are born on the same day, and he is nine hours older than me. So we celebrated our birthday November 9th, and I was born at the University of Penn Museum, and he was born across the river at the Camden Hospital. Well, actually, I wasn't born at the museum. I was born at the University of Penn Hospital. <laughs> and um, so it just goes to show when you put energy out there in a positive way, that is what shows up for you in your life. Um, so the second thing that came to me was, I always remember saying, I wanna be a better person, I wanna be a better person, I wanna be a better person. And that was the main focus once I learned about spirituality and just finding out who I am. Um, so about eight years ago, I learned about the process called the Ho'oponopono, and it's a native Hawaiian process that's been around for thousands of years, and there's a man named Dr. Hugh Len, and he um, no longer travels, but at the time that I learned it with my husband, <coughs> he was coming to the Philadelphia area and teaching it himself, and that's the process of saying, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you. And I had it on note cards, and I took it everywhere with me, and I handed it out to everybody, and that was another shift and change that happened in my life that was a great benefit for me. And then the next thing that I learned about was the oneness blessing. That's a non-denominational meditational process where I do <coughs> oneness blessing groups out of my office at no charge the first Thursday of every month. And the oneness blessing is a hands-on where I would put my hands on somebody and it allows them to connect to their divine and whatever they consider 
their connection to their source. So for some people it could be Jesus, it could be Buddha, it could be the tree around the corner, whatever people connect to. And it's not that they couldn't connect to it themselves, but when you're in a group, everything's intensified. So when we get together, there's a room full of oneness blessing givers and also people that are there for the meditation because we do a chakra balancing meditation and then we do the oneness blessing. So first we open up your chakras and then we put our hands gently on your head and allow you to connect to what you choose to connect to. So I'm aware that that opened a lot of areas up in my life also. <clears throat> and then I happened to watch an Oprah show and I saw Will Bowen. And he's the man that wrote A Complaint Free World. So I sent for one of the wristbands and I read the book. And I also bought the book on audio because when Stephanie was younger, I was, because I have one child, and all of her friends had three and four kids. I was the mom that drove everybody's kids around with my daughter, which was fabulous because you hear things you would have never known about them. <laughs> because you're in the car and they don't think you're there, and they talk about things. Sharon, sorry, we're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, so um, I was the one that drove around the car all the time. So I got a lot of audiobooks. So I happened to listen to this book by Will Bowen, which is fabulous because he reads it himself and he has an incredible personality. And there's also a DVD that goes with this. So at the time that he was on Oprah, he was just starting his journey. And what he shared was that he's a minister at a church in, I'm thinking the Midwest. Um, I have it specifically written down. And he always did something different on Sundays. And he realized that he was starting to complain and he wanted to change that in himself. So he thought of the process of 21 days is what it takes to make a change in your life in any area. So he asked his secretary to find out how they could get a wristband to use for this process. And she called it, oh, another doodad Sunday, meaning he gives things out on Sunday. And she's like, okay, another thing that I'm going to research and find out about, and then people are just going to put it in their drawer. But what she wasn't aware of is that he took this very seriously, explained it to his congregation, and right now today, since 2006, there are, as of today, I looked on the website today, there are over 10,121-something-something-something bands that have gone all around the world of people doing this process. If you go on their website, there's a free 17-page manual that you can download for teachers to use, and it's for kindergarten to 12th graders. And it's to teach children at a very early age to learn to not complain and be in a more positive state and to be more gentle and kind to other people around them in addition to being more gentler and kind to themselves. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about the process. But first what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with everybody your wristband. If you just pass these back. And so put it on whichever wrist is comfortable for you. Does everybody have one? Here you go, Joe. Just got it. Thank you. You good? Got another? Everybody at this table? Here you go. Thank you. You're welcome. So does everybody have their wristband on? And it feels good, doesn't it? Yay, purple! Which is actually kind of funny, because that's my least favorite color in the world. And I've grown to enjoy that color. I wouldn't necessarily I love that color, but I enjoy the color. So the purpose of this evening is to share what a complaint-free world is and the philosophy behind it. And um, so a complaint-free world began in 2006 of July in Kansas City, Missouri. That's Midwest. Good guess. So the idea is a simple idea of putting a purple rubber bracelet on either wrist and when you catch yourself complaining you switch the wrist 
the band to the other wrist. So what is complaining? So the dictionary defines complaining. Exactly. Then you just call the 800 number and you buy another one for a dollar. <laughs> and that does happen. And they do share in here that for some people, it can take up to four months to a year or longer to finish the process. So what happens is, when I did it, nobody knew I was doing it. I didn't even tell my husband. And he didn't notice it for whatever reason. I became very quiet. Because what happens is, you're aware of what you're saying. And you'll say something and you'll realize it's a complaint and you'll switch the band. And you do that enough times and all of a sudden you get quiet. Because you don't have to switch your band for what you think. It's for just what you say. But on the other hand, if you beep your car horn, like the person in front of you is driving not as nice as you would like them to drive and you beep your horn at them, you have to switch your band. That's a complaint. Even though you didn't say anything, you did an action. So it took me, I'm thinking it had to have taken me two or three months. And then I sh finished the process and they have this beautiful certificate that you can get. And I outlined it with purple myself, but you can download this from their website. And now, years later, right now, they actually have a widget on the website that you can hook onto that you can blog and go onto other people's journey as they go through it also, which they didn't have when I did it. So my husband, I told him what I did, and he said, oh, I'd like to do that. So I got him a wristband, and um, it was baseball season. Well, that takes a little longer, because his team wasn't doing so good. And I remember we were walking down the street one night. It is. You know, so pick your season you want to do it in, whatever, you know, you're affected by. But he was um, switching his band, and he wasn't saying anything. <laughs> I'm, like, noticing, and I'm looking at him. And he looked at me, and he smiled, and he goes, I have to say it. So I don't even remember what he said, whether it was a comment about what somebody was walking past us or something we were walking by. But he literally was willing to give up seven days and start moving his band to say what he had to say, because it was so he had to say it. So choice. It added a little bit extra. But just the fact that his baseball team wasn't doing so well, I think that added another whole month or two. It really made it harder on him. Um, so I give them out all the time to people. And I explain to them how to do it. They share that it's good to do it in a group. It's good to have people to be accountable to. I know when I did complete it, the original one that I have had is hanging up on the wall at home with all my jewelry that's hanging up on the wall at home. My particular band says the word spirit on it. I'm not sure if they print that on it anymore. That was some of the original ones because when he first bought them, they had the word spirit on them. I think these are the newer ones. Does it still say spirit on it? Okay. And that's because when he first made them, he made small quantities and he bought it for company that they were already pre-printed. And now he buys so many of them. Um, you can actually go on a cruise with him and a group of people. And the whole focus of the cruise is seven days. And he gives talks to businesses. And he's come up with two more books. He has like a total presence. If you check him out online, he's very entertaining. Um, so we go into discussing like what is complaining? So complaining is to express grief, pain, or discontent. And the average person complains 15 to 30 times a day. And when I was saying to my husband, you know, I was reading this and he goes, that's all? <laughs> so complaints are a statement of fact. So an example is, So there's differences between complaining and just neutral facts. So I feel cold is a neutral fact. But why is this room always so cold? That's a complaint. Um, our revenues and profits are at a historical low. That's a fact. But if you say business stinks, well, that's a complaint. 
I feel tired is a neutral fact, and I'm so tired is a complaint. And they find that one of the things that people complain the most about is the weather. So my husband's a chiropractor, and I work in the office, and I sit at the desk, and I'm so aware that on one day, one person will come in and share that it's too hot, the next person will come in and share that it's too cold, the next person will come in and share that it's too humid. Not a lot of people come in and say, oh, I'm really enjoying the weather today. But it always takes me back to remembering children are always in joy and bliss until they learn from us how to complain. My daughter, when it would rain, was such a happy day for her because that meant she had three umbrellas. She had Polly Pocket, Little Mermaid, and Minnie Mouse. And if it rained, that meant she had a choice. She had one of three umbrellas to use. Now, how many adults go to that? Like it rains. So, wow, awesome. What umbrella am I gonna use today? So what I'm finding out is that if you watch your children as they grow, you see that they learn things like how to complain or how to not do this or not do that because then when they become an adult they unlearn it. So it's not a bad thing that they're learning what's going on in the world because it gives them the growth and the potential to unlearn it as we did. Think of your friends and people that you come in contact with. Like who is the one friend that your friendship is based off of complaining? Like, do you have that one friend that you're the person they call to complain to and you're the person they call to complain to? Because you might be aware, as you're doing this process, they might not be the person you want to talk to for 21 days. Or if you do, it might be the type of situation where you'll listen to them, but you won't be buying into that pattern of complaining. So it'll be a very big aha for you. So there's five reasons why people complain. They complain to get attention. They complain to remove responsibility. Like if somebody is a singer and they're supposed to do a show, they might come into the show saying, I have a really sore throat tonight, please forgive me. And that's their way of removing responsibility from maybe not doing as well as you expect them to do when in all reality, they're gonna do a fabulous job, but they're just taking their responsibility out of it. To inspire envy, who can complain the most? Like one-upmanship of complaining, which wouldn't it be better if you do one-upmanship of what went right in your life today? Um, for power, who's the bigger complainer? And to excuse poor performance. Like when you go to work and you immediately say, I had a really bad night's sleep, I'm very tired. That's kind of to let your coworkers around you know not to expect very much from you today because you're tired. So there's a lot of reasons why people complain. So the things to journal about, if you enjoy journaling is, what person or situation do you tend to complain about most frequently? And just to have that awareness who might you speak directly to to resolve the situation rather than complaining? So what Will shares in his book is, instead of going to the person across from you and talking about somebody who's not in the room and sharing your complaint about them, it's the idea of never talking about somebody behind their back unless what you're saying about them is something that you're comfortable saying right to their face. And that's staying in your integrity. Um, and who's the most positive and optimistic person you know? And how does it feel to be around that person? So why is complaining destructive? Because it causes focus, and your notes may not follow mine exactly, because mine is more an outline of the talk, and that's more like highlights. Um, so complaining causes to us to focus on the problem instead of resolving the problem and going to the next step. Um, it damages our physical and emotional health. 
one of the situations that he shares about in the book is one of the people who now is the head of the sending out the bands and the marketing process of this whole thing has had headaches most of his life. And he was aware that every day when he came home from work, he would share with his wife on a scale of one to 10, his headache at work was a seven. And when they started this process, he realized that he rated the quality of his day based off of the level of pain he was feeling. And he realized the more that he shared about it, the more that he was holding it in his body. So he made a choice to not talk about it anymore because it was a form of complaining. And when he stopped talking about it, he stopped focusing on it. And soon the headaches went away. And then he started realizing that the headaches were gone. And focusing on it was what was perpetrating it and continuing it in his body. So that doesn't mean if you have an ache or a pain to ignore it. Take it to like a doctor or somebody who can really handle it to take care of it if it's a true medical issue. Um, but it's not the kind of thing that you repeat the story and over and over to other people because re by repeating the story, you're holding that in your body in the pain form. So it's about letting go of the story. So if you were to journal about this, where do you find yourself complaining most often? How might you experience in this situation if you refrained from complaining? And what might you do or say to keep from complaining? I remember my cousin sharing that he wasn't enjoying his work very much anymore. And he was aware that he was complaining about it. And then he started realizing that instead of getting a new job, if he got a new perspective on his job, then that would be having a new job. And he made the emotional commitment to have a new perspective on his job. And within a month, he again enjoyed his work, but he changed his attitude, which changed his joy in being at his career. Um, criticism and gossip. Criticisms are complaints directed at someone. And gossip is complaining about someone to a third party, which is what we discussed. So if you were to journal, some of the things that would be great to journal would be, how does it feel when someone criticizes you? And think about that when you're sharing about others. And how does it feel when someone compliments you? And feel how good that feels, like when we were writing on the cards, the dishes on the back of our backs. Like, didn't that feel good just knowing that somebody was writing something wonderful about you on your back? It was like joyful. Well, what if all day long, in some, instead of somebody complaining about something, they were sharing about something happiness? And how would you feel if you knew others were gossiping about you? That's never a good feeling. Um, so I discussed the five reasons why people complain. So if you were to journal, what is a complaint you most recently heard or said? And which of the five basic reasons would you attribute to this complaint? Many complaints fall under multiple categories. Consider the complaint, complaint that was expressed and how to whom would it have been addressed in a positive, productive manner. Because every complaint can be turned around and be turned into a compliment. Attitude of gratitude. So the opposite of complaining is a gratitude. And it's better to talk about things we are thankful for rather than things we are unhappy about. If we focus on negative things, we will notice and attract more negative in our life. And if we focus on positive things, we will move in the direction of greater happiness and more success. So one good thing to do is to journal every night before you go to sleep, have a gratitude journal and write three things you're grateful for for the day. Even if what you're writing is, I'm grateful I get to go to sleep now. <laughs> I'm grateful I brushed my teeth tonight. <laughs> They don't, exactly, <laughs> exactly. See, you're getting the hang of this. And having an attitude of gratitude brings more goodness to you in every area of your life. Um, so how do you become complaint free? 
So scientists believe it takes 21 consecutive days of doing a new behavior for it to become a new habit. <coughs> the most common experience of people who become complaint-free is increased happiness. You'll start to focus on what is good in your life and draw more of that to you. And the goal of a complaint-free world is distribute, to distribute 60 million bracelets around the world, which is only 1% of the population. It's only 1% of the population. And that can translate into transforming the consciousness of the world. And think of what your transformation can do to the people you come in contact with daily, everywhere you go. And the place that I see it the most is the checkout people at the grocery store. If you just smile at them, they're so grateful to just be in your presence and receive a smile. The toll booth takers, if you just say thank you to them, they're so grateful. And have you ever noticed the female toll booth takers have the best fingernail polish in the world? <laughs> like, how is that possible? It's like amazing to me. I compliment all of them. So the bracelet you receive today is a powerful tool to remind you of how well you are creating your life with positive intention. Begin to wear the bracelet. Watch when you're complaining, gossiping, or criticizing, and then you move your bracelet to the other wrist. If you hear someone else who's wearing a purple bracelet complain, and you happen to mention to them that they complained, that's you complaining. <laughs> so it's good to support each other, but then you're also moving your bracelet with them. <laughs> so stay with this, because you will notice that not only what you say changes, but what you think changes. So I hope by doing this process, your holidays will be tenfold better than you could ever imagine. The other modality that I started a year ago is called Access Bars, and I have information here about it. And Maureen was sharing some of her favorite statements that she based her talk off of, which is beautiful. So in Access, they share to come from the question. So when you ask what, you're asking a question and you're not looking for the answer because you're looking for the universe to provide the answer because the universe is so expansive, it would like to provide for us everything and anything we ask for. It's our human limiting beliefs that hold us down and limit us from what comes to us in our life. So I have a few of these and I'll make sure that everybody gets one the next time I come. So access has a mantra and it's all of life comes to me with ease and joy and glory. And glory in this context is exuberant abundance. And they share if you say that 10 times in the morning and 10 times at night before you go to bed, that alone will change your life. So I gave my mother three of these. <laughs> I gave her one to put by her bedside because she's 83 and I wanted her to have it available and ready. So she has one by her bedside table, one at the kitchen table, and one in her purse. And for two weeks, she said, all of life comes to me with ease and joy and glory because they were going for a home loan. And being 83 and 84 and not having an income and living on Social Security and a pension, she was doubtful that would get taken care of. And not only did she get the home loan, but they called her the same day to let her know she received it. And it usually takes like a week to two weeks to get notification. And within a week, they had the money in the bank. So it was her opening up at the age of 83, and she'll be 84 in two weeks. So at the age of 83, my mother shifted her reality with one statement. So what else is possible? So I'm gonna to read to you some of the questions that they share create an amazing life and living. So one of the questions is what else is possible? So when you're 
standing in the grocery store and the item that you want is out of stock, you say, what else is possible? And the universe will provide for you something else better. Um, how does it get any better than this? So say you're walking down the street and you see a penny and you pick it up. You go, how does it get any better than this? And then you walk a little further down the street and you see a dollar and you pick it up. How does it get any better than this? And then you go another couple blocks down the street and you see a diamond bracelet on the ground. And you say, how does it get any better than this? Well, the actual story in one of the books is there was a woman that this happened to in New York City and she actually found a diamond bracelet. And her comment was, it doesn't get any better than this. And right there, she stopped it. Who knows what else she could have received after that? So when good things happen, and even if things that aren't as pleasant happen, the statement is, what else is possible? How does it get any better than this? Um, who am I today? Like This is the best statement to say when you wake up in the morning. And my daughter, who's 22, is starting her day with this statement. Who am I today, and what grand and glorious adventure will I go on? Now, who wouldn't have a good day if you did that? Like, I'm thinking this modality and the wristband, if you say, who am I today, and what grand and glorious adventure am I going on? You're not going to be moving your bracelet very much. Sharon, we just want to thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I enjoyed very much being here. So I'll make sure that you can have these.